Hi everyone, welcome to Gender Spectrum's non-binary interview series. My name is Jenna, I am a project coordinator at Gender Spectrum and I'm here today with Ashley Wild. And we are doing this interview series to really just have conversations and talk about how non-binary can look and feel and mean as an identity for different young people. Uh, so I'm really excited to have Ashley here with us today. Um, I was thinking, why don't we start off if you want to just give a quick introduction of yourself and then we'll just kind of jump into some questions. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Wild. I am 25 years old. I'm a non-binary YouTuber. I've been on YouTube probably coming up on six or seven years now through a variety of different spaces, channels, collaborations. I am from Colorado, but I currently reside in Missoula, Montana. And my YouTube channel is, yeah, Ashley's Wildlife. So you can check that out as well. Awesome. Um, so I thought we could start off with just a little bit about why you identify as non-binary. Like, what does that term mean for you? And why does that feel like the right fit for you right now? So non-binary is a term that I choose to describe my gender almost specifically because it can have so many possible definitions. So I, what I like about it is that it can serve as an umbrella as well as be something that an individual identifies with. So I use that to, to kind of identify that my gender is not man and it's not woman. And in certain instances, I use it uh, to imply that I don't necessarily need to disclose or even have a further explanation than that. Um, sometimes if I do, like if I'm having a great conversation with someone about gender, then I can choose to get into the finer points. But I like that non-binary doesn't disclose anything about my personal experience with gender beyond the fact that, you know, man and woman are not terms that describe me well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it has kind of that like umbrella term for a lot of different things. Exactly. And I like that. Yeah. Um, how did you kind of come about like finding that term? Like what was the process like for you to find that and feel like, oh, that like really represents like how I feel? Well, when I first started um, experiencing some like discomfort or questions about gender, one of the things I did is I turned to the online community. This is, you know, 2010, so Tumblr's huge. So I'm on Tumblr and I'm kind of like, you know, searching things and I'm reading people's posts and I'm realizing that there's more going on than just, you know, maybe I'm, you know, or I'm destined or I have to be a woman and, and that looks like this for the rest of my life. So I started to kind of just take in a lot of information. That's, that's how I try to learn about anything new is just take in a lot of information. And then once I feel like I understand sort of the genre constraints, try to pick and choose a little bit more what's, you know, what do I need to learn more about what feels like me? I learned um, a lot about people who had experiences of identifying as female to male transgender because I was assigned female at birth. That was something that a lot of the people who were transitioning looked a little bit like how I looked like maybe dressed like me or maybe had a similar haircut and so even though you know I wasn't sure how I identified that was something that sparked because I was like well I'm seeing people who remind me of myself mm -hmm. um and that was typically pre-transition or you know just beginning testosterone and so I, I was following these videos and seeing how these people experience those changes and what hormones meant for them and what surgery meant for them and that was really really confusing because I wanted to make sure I was exceptionally open-minded about what my gender might mean both if I was you know like going to transition or if I wasn't I just wanted to make sure I was very thorough but ultimately Ultimately, I realized that at some point in the transition process, I lost my ability to identify with those people who were transitioning, who were identified as FTM. And that was almost more confusing because I was like, well, then, you know, I'm not identifying with people who are like women identified, like lesbians, which is how I had identified previously. And there's a point where I feel like I stopped connecting myself with the experience of these people who are identified as, as female to male transgender and like, what the heck does that mean? 
Mm-hmm. And at the time, I ran into the word gender queer, which is another awesome term that's very vague and very umbrella. And I was like, you know what? I'm not really sure what's going on, but as of right now, you know, this is something that feels more comfortable. I don't feel the need to transition right now. I'm willing to reexamine that, but you know, for the time being, I'm going to, I'm going to pick this word to describe the fact that I'm going through some kind of journey. I'm experiencing something here with my gender. Uh, and that evolved when I found the term non-binary, which is just a little bit broader, a little bit more um, vague and helps me kind of define my own experience with gender. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we sometimes talk about at Gender Spectrum how like folks who identify as non-binary sometimes like it is a process because a lot of times the narratives we see are very much like the male to female or female to male and sometimes it really is a process to figure out like oh hey maybe I don't fit into either of those or maybe this just works for right now. Right. Um, So it's interesting to hear kind of what your process was like. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there anything that you kind of wish that people knew about identifying as non-binary that sometimes feels like people don't get it or like there's like a misconception about identifying as non-binary? Um, I think about the way that we organize our society, like from the smallest levels to the biggest ones, and they all implicate a binary gender mm-hmm. spectrum. And that is really, really frustrating at times. And I think, so I think, for example, about school, like all the way from, you know, preschool through to college, which I was in college when I was exploring my gender. So it was, it was different. I was dealing with adults, but the premise is the same. You know, they would say, um, how do the women in the class feel about this? How do the men in the class feel about this? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, even if I have a thought, the chances I'm going to raise my hand for one of those two prompts are like next to zero, just because it puts me in an unnecessarily uncomfortable position. In other words, I have to volunteer myself and, you know, self-identify just by association as either a man or a woman. And so even if I have thoughts, it almost was like there was just not a space where I was going to, you know, put myself through the discomfort of like volunteering my opinion when neither category that was called out in- incorporated me. Mm-hmm. Others are, you know, worse by the nature of the fact that there's no option to just opt out. Like, you know, class divide up, men on this side, women on this side, or, you know, boys get in the line over there, girls get in the line over there. And I think people who don't understand what it feels like to be non-binary or to be trans or to be you know, in the process of transitioning or even to be questioning your gender, they think that it's, you know, it's coddling to use inclusive language, or they think that it's, you know, it's so fluffy, it's so extraneous, like, why would we bother just pick the closest one kind of thing? And that, for me, like, I, I struggle with that notion, because when you're in that moment, and the teacher has said, you know, men go there, women go there, what it feels like is like panic, like fear, like fight or flight, you're like, uh, uh, like my options are choose between two things that are not right or like what? And the answer is leave. Like I'm the, the two or three times that that happened where I was really put on the spot. I couldn't deal with it in the context of just your everyday class. I didn't come to class to have my gender identity like publicly discussed and or exposed. That's not the purpose of the activity, but that's the outcome. And I was just not interested in doing that. And so I would, I would leave. So, you know, kind of to summarize that and tie it back to the question you asked, what I would like people to know about being non-binary is that, you know, it's not that we, I mean, maybe we do and maybe we don't. I don't think it's necessarily about having like exclusively non-binary spaces or conversations that are geared exclusively toward non-binary people, especially in a context where the vast majority of the people in my class did identify as men or women. But that doesn't mean I wasn't there. You know, I was there. And the fact that it was exclusive by accident, the teacher was not trying to cause me such, you know, a panicky response, but, but they unintentionally did for lack of education, most likely. That situation I was in, and I'm a real person who had a real human emotional response to that. And so, you know, even though maybe statistically, and this is an argument I hear, 
non-binary identities are negligible and therefore you know they shouldn't have to be considered in that context um there's there's a human experience that goes beyond statistics and the more inclusive that a space is the better i'm able to do what i actually came there to do which in this mm -hmm. case is learn mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and I think that speaks so much to how gendered everything is and that when we think about kids in school, it's like boys on this side, girls on this side. And for those people who don't feel like they can really fit into either of those, it's so much energy that you're putting into then figuring out what do I choose or do I leave? Like, is this space just not safe enough for me to be here? Um, yeah, I think those are really, really valid points. Um, switching gears a little bit, is there anything that kind of comes to mind in terms of thinking about what you like about identifying as non-binary because sometimes i think we hear a lot of like the struggles and the spaces that aren't accessible which is so true um but i also want to make some space for if there's things that um you feel are maybe positive about identifying as non-binary um yeah two things come to mind one like more on the superficial kind of like silly fan side and one more on like a, a little bit of a deeper uh, level first and foremost uh when i was growing up and you know until i started to question my identity with those exact words you know i'm questioning my identity for gender i was raised and therefore treated as a female person and uh so one thing that always just sucked was clothes hated them hated clothes couldn't be bothered with bras sports bras were like tight and uncomfortable all my clothes those were like form fitting and I was like okay no and then you know there's like I'm super tall so the jeans were never long enough like the shoes are like barely functional purpley sparkly stuff and I'm just like no I'm not doing this it's not I'm not into it um and then you know I also just like identifying as as queer and going through that process started to kind of maybe experiment with like different clothes like wearing men's jeans or you know what is it like to wear boxers or maybe I'm gonna wear a baggier shirt and kind of swerved like a fully over to the other side so when I did like realize okay I am non-binary in other words like there for me there are there are people on this side of me and there are people on this side of me and they have you know overlap Thing, but you know they have socially prescribed separate like experiences here's what you're meant to wear if you're a woman here's what you're meant to wear if you're a man but there's not rules for me like society does not prescribe what a non-binary person can and can't look like or wear what their you know color scheme should be or what their attire is what is what is business casual for someone who's non-binary well there's not a rule and once I realized that I was like okay so kind of being isolated slash ostracized has its perks because like can't tell me nothing like i'm just gonna make it up uh, and so i have a lot of fun with that and i i really like thrift stores and thrifting just bargain hunting in general and so i have a lot of fun and spend a lot of my time and energy on like digging through goodwill racks like looking for a gem and like i could not care less if it is like you know, a, like in 1970s women's vest or like, you know, dungarees from like <laughs> the men's section. And like, I put stuff together that you would never think of that way. And I just have a blast with it. And I'll be the first to admit it, sometimes it does not work at all. <laughs> and I look like a fool, but I have so much fun playing with it. So I really think that is a fun part of being non-binary. There just aren't rules. And the rules they're trying to apply to me don't apply to me, even if people think they do. And so I just like totally ignore them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing I would say, like a, a level deeper, is that when I am able to build friendships, especially like in person, like I see this person, like we hang out and we do things together and we talk. Uh, one of my good friends, Christian, comes to mind and we have a channel together, Box Wine. And when we hang out, like the fact that both of us are like masculine of center presenting female assigned at birth people like even kind of regardless of other intersections when it's just us like it there's a level of understanding that we're able to achieve that is so like I, it's kind of like if you're um i can't think of the word right now really really thirsty what's the word for that <laughs> Like you're super, oh, like dehydrated, like you haven't had water in a long time. Um, because I go through so much 
lacking and yearning for that ability to see myself and to feel connected and to, and to see my experiences reflected that when you do have it, it is like life changing. Like we were friends immediately overnight. And like to this day, she's one of the like best friends that I have because there is, there is something that I've never really had with another person um, that was that close to me, you know, physically. And, and we can go and do this and go to the bars together. And I just didn't feel so alone when I was around her. And I found that to be like a really special level of connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That piece around, like once you find community or you find someone that can like speak to your experience, it's like even more powerful because you right. don't get that in like your everyday interactions with people. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I think that leads really well into the last question I wanted to ask you, which is really like, you know, for youth who are out there and that are probably going to watch this program and are kind of trying to figure out their gender identity, is there any advice or thoughts or anything that you want to share with them? Yeah, one thing that I think about a lot and I, I spend a lot of time talking about with the young people that I engage in, in my networks and my, you know, viewership is sometimes they'll come to me with a question that is sort of framed in this formula of, you know, I identify as A mm -hmm. and I've come out as A and that was stressful and hard and I went through all this process to be out as A with my family and friends. And now B has happened, which seems to violate sort of the constraints of my A identity. So whether that's I've identified as a lesbian, I've come out as a lesbian, and now I think I might be trans you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm not really sure, but I'm not, I'm not clear how to renegotiate the terms of this gigantic coming out thing that I did, or even just to myself. I thought I was a lesbian. Now I'm, you know, maybe I'm trans or whatever the case is. Um, and what I try to always remind myself through these conversations, as well as share with these young people, is that it is so important for us to remember that language is a servant. You know, we, we create these terms and we come up with these identities and we speak about and we dialogue and we process through what these experiences mean in order to better express ourselves. And a lot of times, and I think especially young people are prone to, you know, not necessarily seeing the gray, that if you identify as this, it's black and white and you're this and you don't have the option to ever be this. Um, and of course, some things are that way, but with identity, especially with sexuality and with gender identity, you know, if you're using a term to describe your experience and now your experience is something different, then that term is no longer serving you. You know, you don't owe it to anyone to continue to identify in a way that doesn't make sense to you. And you also don't owe it to anyone to force your experience into a box. You know, if you do want to continue identifying as a lesbian and maybe you realize that you're non-binary or trans, you know, it's really up to you to create the language that makes the most sense, that most helps you explain your experience. And so, you know, we don't, we don't serve the language. We're not supposed to try to fit our lives inside these boxes. That's actually, you know, that's what we're trying to basically stop doing with the prescribed you know, straight and woman and man or whatever, whatever it is you're battling with. And so I think that's really important to keep in mind. If something is not serving you with regard to language or terminology, then just, you know, luck and light to that term and, and you go on a search or even you just stay without for a while until you find something that feels right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's great advice. It can get hard, I think, to get stuck in all the language. And I think oftentimes mm -hmm. you feel like also once they've picked one path, like they don't it's so hard to go back to something else or to change your path or you feel like maybe you're inconveniencing all these people that you need to re-explain everything to so i think that's great advice to just kind of go with like how you're feeling and to remember that like you always need to advocate for yourself and that your feelings are super valid and even if they change they change and that's totally fine exactly you know i've gone through i mean Combined between my sexuality and gender, I've probably changed the language that I use to identify upwards of four or five times. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not that something necessarily about me changed, but instead that something about me was more clearly revealed or expressed or I learned it. And so I'm just updating, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm changing what person I am all the time. I'm always just me and I'm getting a better understanding of what me looks like. And I think that 
is an important way that we sometimes fail to look at the process of discovering what your identities might be. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this series. Um, for folks watching, we're going to link to Ashley's YouTube page, Ashley's Wildlife, and we'll also link to the gender tag. And you've also made a bunch of awesome resources that you all have in like a whole playlist. So we're going to link to all that too. That will be in the description on the YouTube um, link. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, for folks watching, we also have a non-binary teen group in the Gender Spectrum Lounge. So if you're wanting to meet other kids um, and other youth who identify along the non-binary spectrum, you can link up in there and stay tuned for more interviews in the series. Thank you. Thank you so much.